Hey there guys, today we're taking a look at both the B-Link Surf 5 and the Surf 5 Max head to head with each other. Now this is the Surf 5 with the Ryzen 5 5560U, one of the current versions of the Surf 5 that are available right now. There is a version with the 5700U, but I currently don't have that system in front of me right now, unfortunately. But the version with the 5560U can sometimes be found as low as pretty much $200 to $220. While the Sur 5 Max sense tends to sit around the 300 to 320, but there have actually been some times that it's dropped down to as low as 280. So let's see what that increase in price actually ends up netting us overall in terms of performance. So we're going to be comparing the Ryzen 5 5560U versus the Ryzen 7 5800H. There are going to be some key differences here. The Sur 5 has a TDP of 25 watts that's actually adjustable down to 15 watts. Pretty much can switch between two profiles and we currently have it set to 25 watts. The Sur 5 Max has a stock TDP of 54 watts. You'll find that in the vast majority of games, you're not really going to hit that 54 watts, but you will find that in the vast majority of titles, it's going to be using noticeably more wattage than the Surf 5. So that is something to keep in mind, and that's why you're also going to see some noticeable differences in terms of temperature. We'll of course discuss the thermals and the noise and all of that in the conclusion. First, we're gonna jump on over to all of the performance testing and all that. But before we do any of that, I do want to tell you guys that I would really appreciate it if you would go check out this channel called Small Box Central. I actually recently ended up finding them just in my YouTube recommendations, and I watched a few of their videos and I actually really liked them. The production quality and the information in the videos is pretty fantastic. And I was blown away when I found out that the channel only has 16 videos and less than a thousand subscribers. It's a really great channel if you're interested in mini PCs and ITX systems. And since they're so close to a thousand subscribers, I think it'd be nice to just help push them over the edge. So again, go check them out, guys. Really, there are some fantastic videos there. I'll actually link some for you to check out and be sure to go drop a subscription over there. I would love to see them get to a thousand before even the end of the month. But let's get back to it. Before jumping into the games, we'll take a look at the CPU performance. And here we're taking a look at Cinebench R23 on both systems. As you can see, the single core performance difference between the two is not really that drastically different. There's definitely an uplift with the 5800H due to its higher clock speeds in general, but it's not really meaningful. Where we see the biggest gains is of course in the multi-threaded performance due to the fact that we're dealing with more cores higher clock speeds, and a higher TDP, so each individual core is actually able to just maximize its performance. And in general, what this is going to end up meaning is that in day-to-day -day tasks, both systems are going to effectively run the same. They're really not going to be that drastically different. The 5800H is just going to be slightly faster at tasks just because it's able to boost higher. But a lot of the times, the performance uplift is going to be so unnoticeable because we're talking about increases in performance where some Thing takes a few milliseconds quicker to open. So it's just one of those things where it's not going to be really a noticeable difference. Where you're going to see the biggest gains is in those scenarios where you have to use a lot of CPU cores. In those scenarios, there is actually a pretty massive uplift in terms of performance. But let's jump on right into the games and see what all of that is like. All right, so to start off the gaming performance comparison, here we have Assassin's Creed Mirage, the most recent game release that is going to be tested here. You can see both systems are running the game at the lowest in-game graphics settings, and we are using FSR at the performance preset. And both systems configured like this aren't exactly going to be giving that great of an overall gaming experience. Both seem to really be struggling here. Now, while neither will give you a very playable experience at 1080p with FSR at performance preset, there is still a 35% increase in performance going from the 5560U to the 5800H, at least in terms of the FPS average, while our 1% lows see more of a 23% uplift. In general, though, this uplift isn't going to push it to the level where it's going to become a playable experience really you'd have to really struggle through to enjoy the game at the settings but if you drop down to around 900p and use fsr on top of that you might just be able to do it but visually speaking you might be making quite a few sacrifices there 
Now luckily not all AAA titles are going to end up being like that. As you can see here with Tiny Tina's Wonderland running with the lowest in-game graphics settings on both systems, you can see that there are some pretty massive differences in terms of performance here. This game really sees some insane gains going from the 5560U to the 5800H, where in terms of the FPS average, we're looking at a 50 percent increase in FPS, but even more impressively, our 1% lows see a 60% increase. So what that means is that there is a drastic level of uplift happening here, and considering that these two systems aren't that drastically different in terms of price, it's definitely something to take notice of. Of course, the game also does support FSR. We didn't use it here at all, but we can use FSR to see what kind of uplift we can see in the 5560. You. And interestingly enough, there is a pretty substantial uplift now with our FPS average getting very, very close to what the 5800H was doing at native res, but still not reaching it. Though interestingly enough, the 1% lows never really saw any uplift. So it seems that even though FSR was actually able to make the FPS average noticeably better, Overall, the gaming experience is not really going to feel that much better because the huge variance between those 1% lows and the FPS average. That means there's frequent stuttering that is happening throughout the actual gaming experience. And of course, this is not even including the fact that with the 5800H, we could also just turn FSR on to performance mode if we want to get insane levels of performance. The fact that we're able to actually play the game really, really well at native res just means that we have headroom to play around with, with FSR. Because FSR at the performance mode, not exactly the best looking thing. But FSR at the ultra quality or quality preset actually looks pretty good and you're pretty much just getting free performance at that point. And you can just activate that on the 5800H and it widens its lead even more without having to make itself look noticeably worse. Now Red Dead Redemption 2 was an interesting game to test for sure because it is extremely demanding. We are running this at the lowest in-game graphics settings. We are using the textures at the ultra setting though. And of course we are using FSR at the performance preset. Now here we see some more massive gains, where the 5560U is a pretty brutal experience and jumping over to the 5800H, we actually end up seeing a 45% increase in terms of our FPS average and a 47% increase in the 1% lows. So we go from a pretty much unplayable gaming experience to now what is essentially a very rock solid 30 FPS gaming experience. Both really are very consistent in that there's not much of a gap between the 1% lows and the average, but only one of these is really giving an actually playable experience. And yeah, it's at the edge of that, but the point is it can actually do it. And this is one scenario where FSR can't save the 5560U because of the fact that it's already using FSR. Batman Arkham Knight is another frequently benchmarked game by me. And here we are using it with the lowest in-game graphics settings on both systems. And as you can see, there is again a pretty drastic difference in terms of how either system plays. Jumping from the 5560U to the 5800H is going to net you a 38% increase in the FPS average and a 41% increase in the 1% lows. And what that means is that you go from struggling to even keep a consistent 30 FPS average to pretty much comfortably above that and overall that's just going to lead to a far better gaming experience. Now next up was Deus Ex Mankind Divided, a game that even though it is a few years old now is still a very very demanding game and it can really put these little mini PCs on their knees and you can see here that neither system really does a great job playing this game at 1080p with the lowest in-game graphics settings. But there is still a difference between the two. Though neither system really did this game justice, there was still a pretty much 30% uplift on both the FPS average and 1% lows between the two systems. But again, not really a big enough uplift to make a meaningful difference in terms of making this a playable experience. Experience, but imagine the vast majority of people that try to play this game and 
get it like this, are not really going to enjoy it. But of course, you can always drop things down to 900p or 720p, and then the 5800H actually sees a much more noticeable uplift. And the last game that I wanted to check out was Bioshock Infinite running at the Ultra Graphics settings. While this game is pretty much a decade old at this point, at the Ultra Graphics, it can also bring these little mini PCs to their knees. And here you can see that both systems are really struggling at its maxed out graphics settings. If we were to go with something like low or very low, both systems would do a fantastic job, but you can still see that there is a meaningful difference here. Again, we're seeing around that 30% performance uplift that has been the most common difference between the two. Though again, we did see in certain titles that the uplift could be massive for the vast majority of the titles that we looked at. The difference is really closer to around 30%. Though in this title, it does mean that we can actually get away with playing Bioshock Infinite at the ultra graphics settings on the Sur 5 Max if we really wanted to. While that's not really something we could say about the 5560U unless you're more than happy to play at sub 30 FPS, but there is some headroom here for graphical adjustments on both. So after seeing those gaming comparisons, you're probably thinking, well, why would anyone ever buy the 5560U? Well, there's actually some pretty meaningful differences between the two systems. For one, if you notice throughout all of the benchmarks, the amount of wattage that each system was using was drastically different. In a lot of those gaming titles, the Sur 5 Max is going to pretty much utilize sometimes even half of the wattage that the Sur 5 Max is using. And while the power savings might not be that great if you live somewhere with cheap electricity, something that is nice is that with lower wattage comes lower heat. And lower heat means lower noise. And the Sur 5 is an extremely quiet system. At full load it's definitely audible but it's only audible if you have it right next to you if you have it behind your monitor or if you just have it sitting just even a little bit away from you you're really not going to notice it especially if you just have speakers and you're just playing like a youtube video at normal volume the sound of the fan on the sur 5 pretty much just gets drowned out while the sur 5 max is pretty much the opposite of that where at full load the fan will just screech at you it will actually just just turn into a jet engine. You'll even feel it just blasting the air in the back extremely hard because obviously the chassis is not that different from all of the other Sur 5s that we've seen. So the size is the same, internals have been reworked, cooling systems have been reworked, but we're dealing with a limited amount of space here to put a heat sink and a fan. So the only options that you have are either more heat sink, and if we can't do that, you just turn up the speed of the fan. And that's pretty much exactly what they did here. So if you're doing any heavy tasks or anything like that, the Sur 5 Max is definitely going to become far more noticeable, but it's really only in those gaming scenarios we're going to be playing for a very long time that it's going to get noticeably loud. But in those scenarios, you're wearing headphones and stuff like that, so you're not really going to notice. I don't think it's going to interrupt your gaming experience. But if you want something dead silent, that Sur 5 is just insanely good. It's just so quiet. It's so power efficient. And when you look at the CPU performance, it's the same single core that matters for 99% of tasks out there because really most things while they are multi-threaded nowadays they either finish so quickly on both systems anyway that it doesn't really matter or you're using it for a very specific task where neither system is really going to be probably adequate enough for you. For example if you're doing things like home servers then yeah I can maybe understand finding the Sur 5 Max being more interesting but if you just need a day-to-day -day computer the Sur 5 is an insane value. But if gaming is something that you care about, the Sur 5 Max is just going to give you a pretty meaningful uplift. But if that's something that you care about, then the Sur 6 Max is definitely a consideration because RDNA 2 comes with some meaningful uplifts. Already between the Sur 5 Max and the Sur 6 Max, there could be as much as a 100% increase in performance in certain titles, with the vast majority looking at more around a 40 to 60% uplift. But already there's a average of 30% difference between this and the Sur 5 Max. 
So this going to the Sur 6 Max is astronomically different levels of gaming performance. Now, whether or not that's worth it to you is something that you have to consider here. It's interesting because we just took a look at the 6600H and compared it to the 7735HS, which is just the 6800H. And what became very clear was that for the 6000 series, just one tier had such a drastic performance difference where we were looking at sometimes as much as a 60 to 70 percent increase in performance going from the 6600h to essentially a 6800h in this case we're looking at a ryzen 5 compared to a ryzen 7 but this ryzen 5 is a little weird because again the igpu in here is what belongs in a ryzen 3 so when you look at it like that when you look at what the performance difference is like between something like the 5300u and the 5800h then these numbers start to make a lot more sense it's not to say that the 5560 U is a bad CPU because it is Zen 3. The IPC is really nice on it. It's an extremely efficient chip. It's just that the iGPU is very cut down. But if gaming doesn't matter to you, you get a lot of CPU performance per dollar here. And at that price, it pretty much destroys any other mini PC in that category. Because at the $200 rate range, you're looking at either refurbished systems that are rocking old i5s and i7s from like 8th gen, or you're looking at Celeron and Pentium levels of performance. And here you get six Zen 3 cores with 12 threads. You get the upgradable memory that's actually dual channel, not single channel like what Alder Lake N CPUs are like. The N95 and the N100 are only single channel memory. And you have systems selling for $200 that have those, while this at $200 is six cores, 12 threads, two memory slots, dual channel can go all the way up to 64 gigabytes of RAM at 3200 megahertz and you can upgrade the M.2 SSD, and you also get room for a SATA SSD. So there's a lot of room to actually grow off of this system. And the same applies for the Sur 5 Max, of course, it does have the upgradable slots as well. But again, that is one to consider if gaming is something that really matters to you and you want that extra CPU performance. But if you could spare the money, the Sir 6 Max is just going to give you that much more of an uplift. This is the kind of computer that I would pretty much give to any family member that just needed a computer, really. It's just so absolutely quiet. You get so many cores, so no matter what it is that they're doing, they're never going to run into any issues. And really, you just feel a lot more comfortable just giving them this and having Windows installed on it versus something like the N100, where those four cores are very powerful, but not that great when we're dealing with Windows running a billion things in the background. So let me know down below which one of these systems you find the most compelling, and I'll see you guys in the next one.